So if we move on uh, to our first and only speaker for this afternoon. So that's, um, we have Lucy Johnston, who is, now what have I got written down about you, Lucy? Consultant clinical psychologist, and I'm sure you'll have other things to tell us too. So welcome to, to Lucy for her talk. Thank you very much. Can I just check this is on and working? Can people hear me? If you stop being able to hear me, please wave your hands around and I will get closer to it. Thank you for inviting me along today. Um, I've got a very difficult job to follow this morning's speakers, um, but I will do my best. And um, I have another slight handicap in that there are some of my work colleagues in the audience, but I have given them strict instructions not to disagree with me, contradict me, or in any other way make my life difficult. So let's hope we can keep that under control. And um, what I'm hoping to do is to follow up some of the themes of this morning, um, which I think are about finding non-diagnostic ways and non-medical ways of um, working with severe distress, particularly working with what we might call psychosis. Um, it's not a word that I like very much, which is why I put it in speech marks, but nevertheless, it's a, we sort of know what we mean when we talking about talk, when we use that word. And I think you know a lot of this morning's talk has given us some ideas about how to uh, move things forward. But I think that certainly certainly raises very big questions, doesn't it? If we take these critiques on board, how do we try and set up services and run them differently? And most importantly, perhaps you know think about way people in different ways, think about distress in different ways, because. As Sammy rightly said, you know, it's the thinking that underpins almost everything else, and it's that that needs to change, I think, and we need to work that through into the services that we offer people. So that's what I'm going to try to do. <clears throat> and I very much want to pick up one of the themes of this morning, which is about stories. If there's a single way of thinking about what do we do in instead of using diagnosis, I think, in a nutshell, it's we listen to people's stories. That came out strongly from several of the talks this morning. Um, so I'm going to talk about one particular kind of story, which is called a formulation. It's a bit of an obsession of mine, um, but um, it's an example. And not, it's not the only way of listening to people's stories. There are other ways, but it's a way, I think, which has some credibility in services, has some specific advantages, has some research attached to it, and I think can be a way of taking some of these morals and these ideas forward. So that's what I'm going to do. And first of all, I want to just talk a little bit about, this is slightly confusing actually. Yes, that's where we are, okay. What do we mean by formulation? Um, well, in essence, a formulation is, as Eleanor said, rather similar to a construct. Formulation, if you like, is the kind of professional jargon version of it. Uh, construct, if you like, is perhaps a more democratic version and has some perhaps additional strengths in, in that sense. But nevertheless, I'm going to give you the psychology definition and I'm going to show you an actual example in a minute. So all formulations summarise the client's core problems, show how the client's difficulties relate to one another by drawing on psychological theories and principles, suggest on the basis of psychological theory why the client has developed these difficulties at this time and in these situations, give rise to a plan of intervention, and are open to revision and reformulation. A lot of similarities with um, constructs. And a formulation might look like a kind of paragraph, it might look like a diagram, it could take a, a number of different formats. It's been part of psychology jargon for many years, and um, a couple of my favourite quotes. A formulation is a tool used by clinicians to relate theory to practice. So a formulation is very much co-constructed, put together collaboratively between a clinician and a service user, and what the clinician brings is their not their experience, knowledge of the evidence, of the research and so on. What the, form, the service user brings is their own personal experience and the sense they've made of it. And by putting those two things together, we hope we can develop a hypothesis in professional language, a best guess in kind of more ordinary language about what is the best way forward. Once we've got a general shared idea about the nature and the reasons for the problem, we can together work out a way forward. So it's about tailoring the evidence, if you like, and knowledge and experience to the individual. And I like this quote, at some level it all makes sense. The absolutely core assumption, it seems to me, of a formulation and a formulation-based practice is that there is a way of making sense of people's experiences. 
and that absolutely includes the experiences that we call psychosis. So the moral is, I think, that however unusual or alarming sometimes or risky or perhaps scary or chaotic or overwhelming someone's experiences, there is a way of making sense of it. There's no point at which we have to stop and say, this is schizophrenia, which is a shorthand way of saying there isn't a way of making sense of it. There is always a way of making sense of it. Okay, and for anyone who is really keen to read more. I usually bring along some books to flog, but I, I forgot this time. Anyway, this is a um, second edition of a co-edited book. I'm one of the editors, Formulation in Psychology and Psychotherapy, um, and it came out, the second edition came out last year. It's got a chapter on team formulation, which is one of the things I'm going to talk about in a minute. And if you're really, really, really keen, you could go onto the British Psychological Society website and download this um, very interesting set of guidelines. It's a guidelines for best practice in psychological formulation. I was um, headed up a working party in 2011 putting together these guidelines. As far as I know, they're the first set of professional guidelines for doing formulation according to best practice. Um, but and although they're issued on behalf of my professional body, the Division of Clinical Psychology, we'd be very happy for them to be used more widely. And they summarise what's known about formulation to date and the different types of practice that people might use. So here's an example. I've invented this example. This is, might be a service user who came along to services. As you can see, I've um, said that she reports no particular problems at home or at school, has worked at a shop for the last five years, she has a good relationship with her mother who lives nearby. Last year, Jane started to find work too stressful and took time off sick. She started to hear a hostile and critical voice. She is now very distressed and too terrified to leave the house. So it's the kind of thing that might attract a diagnosis of psychosis or schizophrenia. So if you're adopting a formulation-based approach, then ideally what you would do is sit down, someone would sit down with Jane and as and when she's ready, try to work out a shared understanding, a formulation, a story, which actually puts the meaning behind those experiences. So this might take quite a while and of course, like a construct, it's always open to revision and so on. But after a while working together, you might be able to produce something like this. Again, I've invented this one. Can you read it from the back? or I'll, I'll read it out in case you can't all see it. OK, you had a happy childhood until your father died when you were age eight. As a child, you felt very responsible for your mother's happiness and pushed your own grief away. Later, your mother remarried, and when your stepfather started to abuse you, you did not feel able to confide in anyone or risk the break of the marriage. You left home as soon as you could and got a job in a shop. However, you found it increasingly hard to deal with your boss, whose bullying ways reminded you of your stepfather. You gave up the job, but long days at home in your flat made it hard to push your buried feelings aside anymore. One day, you started to hear a male voice telling you you were dirty and evil. This seemed to express how the abuse made you feel, and it also reminded you of the things your stepfather said to you. You found day-to-day -day life increasingly difficult as past events caught up with you, and many feelings came to the surface. Despite this, you have many strengths, including intelligence, determination and self-awareness, and you recognise the need to revisit some of the unresolved feelings from the past. OK, so that's an invented example to give you the flavour. But if this was a workshop, then I would be saying to you, what differences do you notice between the diagnosis and the formulation? How might those be experienced differently by the client? And, you know, people usually identify differences, like the formulation is expressed in ordinary language, it, it's in, individual to the person, no, no person's formulation is going to be identical to anyone else's. It suggests some way forward, you know, that's the main purpose if you like, so ha where do we go from here? Um, we hope that it gives a sense of, sort of hope and strength to the individual, it's not just about what's wrong with you, but what's right with you, how well you've done to survive this far, and so on. So. It's a very different kind of way of looking at it and a very different kind of explanation. Um, well, I do agree with Sammy that actually diagnoses aren't an explanation. This, I think, is, is a, you know, much more meets the criteria of actually explaining something. And I like these quotes, a process of ongoing collaborative sense making. This is, in a sense, it's a result of an ongoing therapeutic conversation. You can, at some arbitrary point, decide, well, I'm going to summarise this. It might be useful to write it down, to think about it. But in a sense, the process of formulating goes on before and after the point at which you might decide to make a summary. 
and it's a way of summarising meanings, of negotiating for shared ways of understanding. Negotiation is an important word there, isn't it? It's not my expert view, it's our shared understanding together. And I hope that any formulation, any decent formulation, has some meta-messages, if you like, overall messages, which are essentially that anyone else who'd been through the experiences that you have had in your life might have ended up feeling the same way. So it's a kind of normalising message, if you like. These are normal responses to abnormal situations. And I would say those are the very opposite of the messages that are given by diagnosis. It's not about what's wrong with you, it's about what's happened to you. <clears throat> so the main purpose of formulation is to decide what to do next. And it has a number of other purposes. This is an extract from the guidelines. I won't go through all these in detail. But in essence, it's about working out, you know, clarifying our hypotheses, noticing what's missing is a very important one often. It's often not until you sit down and start to try and summarise things that you realise, well, I never asked when this started, or I never understood what happened to your parents' breakup or whatever. It's about, um, I'm going to select one or two of these. It's a framing medical interventions is something I always think is important. Nearly all service users will probably be on medication at some point. We may have to do things like um, take people into hospital, but these events in themselves are going to have meanings for the person that fit in with their formulation. For example, someone who's experienced very coercive, unpleasant experiences is likely to react in a particular way to a forced, to a, you know, a, to being sectioned or whatever, doesn't mean we can always avoid it, but it means we need to be very aware of the meanings and the way that person is like to experience those things. Ditto medication. If you start to ask people, you know, how do you experience your medication, you get some very unusual answers, and it very often ties in with a lot of other things in their life, and we need to be aware of those personal meanings. It's about thinking about lack of progress. Um, at every point in working with someone, we are very likely to get stuck at some point. That's just part of the work we do. And to my mind, the first thing you should be asking then is, what does the formulation suggest? If the formulation doesn't suggest anything, then it's probably something missing. You need to revisit the formulation. So it's a way of um, troubleshooting, thinking about what do we do now we've reached this point. Um, I pick out one or two. Strengthening the therapeutic alliance, emphasising strengths as well as needs, normalising problems, increasing the service user's sense of agency, meaning and hope. Agency, by that I mean the, the belief and the um, confidence that you can do something you know, with support to make changes in your own life. Okay, so that's in a nutshell what a formulation is. Um, and interestingly, formulation is becoming an increasingly popular concept. It used to be an obscure piece of psychology jargon of interest only to um, clinical psychologists and other minority health professional groups. It's kind of escaped into the wild recently, if you like. It's extraordinary. It's appearing everywhere. Um, if you want to get involved in some particularly heated and at times unpleasant debates about formulation, you can... Uh, that's my Twitter hashtag. Um, are there are even a couple of blogs about formulation. Now, isn't that extraordinary? I mean, I, I think overall it's a good thing because it's a sign of a concept that's kind of, you know, reached its... Um, you know, we're, it's something we're ready to take on board, I hope, although I have to say a lot of the comments have been very attacking. It's mentioned in DSM-5. That's interesting, isn't it? They've got a very bizarre definition of it, I have to say, but nevertheless, the word's in there. It's recommended at least three times in the recent NICE guidelines that came out last month. Oddly enough, it's frequently cited as part of a defence of psychiatric diagnosis. So this month's British Journal of Psychiatry has an um, editorial defending diagnosis, and um, in the process of editorial, I think they mentioned formulation five times. It's quite odd. Not as an alternative to diagnosis, but as part of a kind of fig leaf, as this is how I see it, that um, formulation has been kind of dredged up as a concept that I think that can be can fill some of the holes in diagnosis, if you like. Actually, we are you know, looking at people's lives and relationships because we formulate as well as diagnose. That's the story. But I think there's a very important definition between what I would call psychiatric formulation, which is an addition to diagnosis, and psychological formulation, which is actually an alternative to diagnosis. So just to elaborate on that slightly, um, formulation is a core skill in psychiatrist training manuals. They are required to demonstrate the ability to construct formulations of patients' problems that include appropriate differential diagnoses. And, you know, any formulation is better than no formulation. So, I mean, I'm pleased to see it in there. 
but however we were quite clear in our clinical psychology guidelines that uh, psychological formulation is not price premised on a functional psychiatric diagnosis. So it's the difference between a formulation of Jane, for example, that might look like schizophrenia triggered by stress at work, that might be a psychiatric formulation, formulation plus diagnosis, and hearing the voice of your abuser due to unresolved past trauma, that would be a psychological formulation, and I think you can see those are quite important differences, aren't they? They're quite profound differences. Okay, and I mean, I think it's worth saying these are out ways of thinking. It's, there are many very psychologically minded psychiatrists who use what I would call psychological formulation. There are some rather medically minded clinical psychologists who are very happy to work with diagnosis. It is about ways of thinking, but these are important distinctions. And I think one of the things that typically happens in psychiatry is that you know, fairly radical concepts, I think recovery is quite a good one, get kind of sanitised, they get absorbed into the system, they get stripped of the more radical elements, and somehow the kind of whole biomedical model rumbles on as before. And I think that's what is in danger of it. It's almost like a fight for ownership, a fight for definition of formulation at the moment. So anyway, you can tell which side I'm going to be on. Um, okay, is everyone keeping up with me? I hope it's not too fast. So I want to talk a little bit more about a slightly different use of formulation. Um, so far we talked a bit about formulation one-to-one, -one, so that might be work that somebody did with Jane, for example, or it might be a more construct style, as Elena was describing. And a more recent um, way of using formulation is using it in the context of teamwork. So the idea is that in this case, this is about a whole team or a group of people working with a particular service user, getting together to, to think together about how do we understand this person's problems. And you can do it in various ways. You can do it as kind of you know, occasional meetings. You can do it as a regular part of the team's timetable. Or ideally, from my point of view, would have it integrated into every part of the service from assessment onwards. I'm going to show some details of that in a minute. And the aim of this, I think, is to get out of what I see as a very unproductive way of thinking in mental health services, which I call the kind of problem-solution way of thinking. Problem, Jane's hearing voices. Solution, give her these drugs. Problem, she's still hearing voices. Solution, give her more drugs. Problem, she's not coping at home. Solution, admit her. Problem, she's broken down again. Solution, readmit her. We're all familiar with these cycles. And one way of getting out of that cycle is to have a problem formulation solution you know, which I think gives us new and more creative and collaborative and hopefully more effective ways of moving forward. So there is a very small amount of research looking at the advantages of team formulation, which are um, in addition to the advantages of um, using it with one-to-one -one with individuals. And here's a list. Again, this is an extract from the guidelines. It's about achieving consistency or approach to intervention. How easy is to do that in teams? Not usually very easy at all. Generating new ways of thinking, because we can all get together and bounce ideas off each other. Dealing with core issues rather than getting stuck in the trap that we so often find ourselves in. Dealing with crises. Um, improving morale, supporting each other with complex clients. Increasing team understanding and empathy. Drawing on everyone's expertise. Helping people to manage risk. Reducing the feelings that as professionals we inevitably have at times of, kind of negative perceptions. Working with the inevitable different perspectives within teams at times. So how can we have a shared perspective that we all sign up to given that there are bound to be some individual differences between us. Uh, thinking about responsibility, a very important thing. Promoting more psychological thinking and conveying messages about hopes for change. So there's a small amount of evidence to support the idea that team formulation does have those kind of benefits within teams. And in a way, it's a kind of staff consultation. That's one way of thinking of staff supervision, staff consultation. If you want to change services, I think you need to do more than do better work with one-to-one -one with individuals. You also need to think about whole teams and the way teams function. So I'm going to give you an extremely brief look at some examples. This is an odd air example of a kind of practice that seems to have sprung up sort of simultaneously in all sorts of places. So there's a number of other service, services using this model. And I'm not going to go into these in detail because you've got the slides in front of you, but this is um, uh, describing a service on an inpatient ward which was very positively evaluated. Um, this is describing two psychiatrists working in a rehab centre who set up regular rehab me uh, formulation meetings in their service. And as you can see, people made some very positive comments about it. OK. 
Okay, I'm going to rush forward. Um, this is a very impressive example of an older adult service in Tees, Esk and Weir, where over, over a six or seven year period, they've actually had this enormously ambitious project that started small and has grown, which is about implementing a formulation-based understanding into every part of the service, every part of the care pathway, from initial assessment onwards. And it's now, they've trained 400 plus staff of all grades. I understand that even includes the cleaners, very important people on wards. Uh, they've got a lot of background paperwork so that it really gets thoroughly integrated into the systems. They have a kind of, they call their model CBT plus a bit. It's a particular kind of structure they have. And they're integrate, they're evaluating it and publishing it. But it appears to, have, you know, it's certainly been taken on board with a great deal of enthusiasm in the service. And it appears to be having a number of very positive outcomes. So that's, I think it's a fantastic argument, you know, a fantastic example of actually how you can do it. Um, last year I took, this is the kind of sad thing I tend to do in my annual leave, I took two years, weeks out of my annual leave and I went and trained the entire older adult and adult mental health um, workforce in the Sussex Partnership Trust, an older adult AMH service done in the kind of south of England, because they equally have a very ambitious project about they want to integrate formulation into all parts of their care pathway from initial assessment right through to working with longer term people who've been in the service for a while. So, and you know, that hasn't been without its difficulties in implementation, but it appears to be embedding in the system. It appears to be valued by, by the staff. I'm now going to give you a little example from down the road. This is where I work, um, Kumtaf Health Board. I've been there for three years. And um, I've been keen to try and introduce some of this stuff into Kumtaf. And the idea is to try and introduce regular weekly meetings into the teams in around there. So it's um, along the, the lines that, that are up there. This is how, how we've been trying to do it. Um, and we have a very simple format, really not very complicated. The idea is that once we're all gathered together, we have, um, we think about, well, actually we do it a bit differently in different parts of the service, but this is how it works in at least some of the community mental health teams. What is the current question or stuck point? That's often quite a good starting point. Somebody has been detailed to bring along the background of the service user, so then we can think, is the background correct? If not, let's fill some details in. The central part of the meeting, develop a shared formulation. What do we think is going on psychologically? What are our best guesses? And what usually happens when you've got everyone in the room is that everybody has a lot of very creative, interesting ideas. And it's usually a very democratic process, I think, because actually the people who know most are often people, you know, who support workers and other people who actually spend most day to day, day time with the service user. We then have a think about drawing out in implications for intervention. The facilitator um, writes it up, we circulate it, we add it to the records, we review it as necessary in future meetings. And of course, we want to inform and involve the service user as much as possible. And we would hope, if at all possible, that a parallel process is going along with the service user. But I think in relation to psychosis, what's important to notice is that you know, the moral is the team needs to have a formulation, even if the service user is not currently in a state to do that kind of work themselves, which they may not be. It may be a state of complete chaos or confusion. It may not be possible to have those kind of conversations with them, but we need to have an understanding ourselves, and we may need to hold it very tentatively. It may take a while before we're able to confirm this in any sense with the service user, but we can't not have a high hypothesis. Otherwise, you default simply to the kind of admission and drugs role and not much else. So it's never too early to start formulating. Equally, it's never too late. And um, some of the people we've started to do formulation work with have been in the service 10, 15, 20 years. Rarely are there simple, easy answers, but rarely are we completely stuck for ways forward. Nearly always, I hope that we feel, or at least we've got a bit of a better handle on this, at least we've got some avenues to take forward. Okay, and one of the things that I try to be in um, my day-to-day -day work life is to be pro-formulation rather than anti-diagnosis. It's um, not usually helpful to go along to teams and kind of start rubbishing diagnosis. Um, I'm kind of blowing my cover a bit here today, and, uh, but I dare say it's possible that people ha in my health board have noticed that I'm not very keen on diagnosis. It's possible that view has slipped out. 
but um, strategically, I think it's important to offer alternatives. And my experience is uh, not just in Comtaf but elsewhere that actually sometimes you can move quite a long way without having to get into awkward or uncomfortable or confrontational discussions. And you know, certainly in the community mental health team where I spend most time at the moment, we routinely have meetings of an hour when nobody mentions the diagnosis. It's quite interesting, and I ask the CPN or someone to do a summary beforehand. They don't even put the diagnosis in. It kind of becomes an irrelevance, and I think we have much more productive discussions as a result. So, uh, I didn't come to come out for the grand plan to take over uh, and to insinuate formulation in all parts of the service. It's kind of grown organically, which is kind of quite interesting. You know, I've offered training to a team, and another team has heard about it and said, "Can we have some?" So um, this is a brief evaluation of the training. So the big tall block is for people who found the training very useful uh, or the slightly smaller block useful. Um, so it's gone down quite well. The idea of the trainee is to kind of sell the model to people, if you like, and give them a bit of confidence that this is something they can contribute to and that might be useful for them. So we now have regular meetings, reasonably regular. Um, it varies a bit according to the team, and different teams do it in different ways, running in um, all parts of the service. Uh, we're working on implementing it more regularly on all the inpatient wards. And uh, I think the rehab service has the most thoroughly integrated model, actually, and they use a number of different formulation templates for different parts of the, the person's journey through their care pathway. And I would like to pay tribute to my colleagues, to be honest, not just because they're just sitting there, but... Um, I, I've actually found this really a, quite a relatively easy and rewarding process to be part of. My psychology colleagues have taken this on with a great deal of enthusiasm, and at the moment all the meetings are facilitated by psychologists. I don't think that's how it should be. I very much want to devolve that. In my team we've sometimes managed to get one or two of the social workers to take on that role. That's great. You know, It doesn't have to be and shouldn't be just a psychology skill. And I found a, a lot of support from managers, from consultants, from medics who've made the effort to turn up, who have contributed, so we can have a really properly shared plan. So I'm touching wood now. So far, it's all, you know, really been a very rewarding process for me personally. So thank you to my colleagues. And we had some Cardiff psychologists come and visit us recently, and they said, that sounds interesting. Can we do it on our health board? So it's coming to Cardiff too. And, as I say, it's being spread around a number of other places in the country. Um, here's a very, very brief initial evaluation of staff experiences of this approach. So this was done by a trainee who I had working with me who um, gave a questionnaire to um, 31 staff who'd participated in these meetings. And the questionnaire was based on the slide I showed you earlier about the, hypo the, the benefits of team formulation, like in raising staff morale and giving us more ideas for a way forward. So what he did was to turn each of those possible benefits into a question. So to what extent has participating in these meetings helped you personally or helped the team to find a way forward to increase your morale and sense of hope for the service user and so on. And you probably can't, you don't need to read all these teeny tiny writing and these teeny tiny figures, but essentially uh, the first column is the mean, the averages. So the um, questions can be rated one, not at all, to seven very much. So the highest possible mean average could, would be seven if every single person who had asked thought that, that the team formulation meetings had been maximally helpful in that particular way. And I'm pleased to say that the means are very, very high across all dimensions, 6.6, 6.3, 6.0, 6.7, 5.8, and so on. So, you know, the, what, this didn't involve a great many staff, but at least on the face of it, it looks like um, the professionals are finding it a very, very useful process. Now, that's not quite the same as saying it's useful to the service users and it creates better outcomes. Those are further things to look at, which we do want to look at. But it's a good starting point. And in fact, um, my trainees carried on collecting forms. We now have about 50, and they're all coming out equally positive. And that's going to be published shortly. So here's some of the informal comments that people made. Uh, the meetings gave me a sense of not being on my own, useful in planning a way forward, and so on and so on. And um, interestingly, we, um, 
my trainee's done this clever thing called a factor analysis. I don't really understand it, but it's looking at what are the kind of underlying factors that come out of the results, and there appear to be two main, the factors that are helpful appear to group in two main ways. One to do with content. It was useful to think, to come up with a formulation, to draw on sort of evidence that might be useful and so on. And the, and the other was to do with process. It was useful to discuss our feelings about how we work together as a team. So I think those are two essential aspects, aren't they? Thinking and feeling, which I think can be captured and used in a formulation meeting. And, you know, before I sound too evangelical, I haven't got time to go into this in detail, but this is not a perfect way forward and it doesn't always work as well as it should. And speaking as a facilitator, it can be a process that's quite stressful and complex and there can be differences that don't feel very comfortable. And, you know, sometimes we end up not getting the kind of, you know, we need to revisit the plan quite regularly and rarely do people recover overnight. You know, it's not a perfect answer, but it, I think it offers some important principles which incorporate a lot of the stuff we've already been talking about this morning. So I'm now going to try and <clears throat> tailor some of this to thinking about psychosis, which is the subject of today. Many of the people that we work with and we try to construct formulations for are, of course, people who have experienced various forms of what could be called psychosis. And as I said, the person themselves may not be in a position to, draw, to join in, but we need to have an understanding right from first contact with services, ideally. And this is where we draw on some of the kind of recent research, which previous speakers have mentioned, about you know, what is going on in psychosis. Unusual beliefs and experiences have symbolic meanings that may give important clues about the origins of the difficulties. So it's about trauma. This is the second time you've seen this meta-analysis by Varese et al. You know, there's very strong evidence that what we see are very, perhaps best understood, not as illnesses with biological causes, but traumas with psychological consequences. And the work of John Reed, who's a clinical psychologist, highlights a lot of this. Um, I use these slides in team training because I think these are things that people need to know about. They're shocking figures. Um, the middle paragraph, for example, there is evidence of a dose-dependent relationship between the severity, number, and number of types of traumatic episode and the likelihood of psychosis. People who are abused as children are 9.3 times more likely to develop psychosis. The risk rises to 48 times for the severest abuse. People who experience three times of abuse are 18 times more likely to be psychotic. Five times of abuse are 193 times more likely. So these are very frightening figures, aren't they? And I think this really poses a very fundamental challenge to what I see as a traditional form of psychiatric thinking, which seems to go something like this. You know, history. Uh, father was alcoholic, let's say, bullied at school, sexually abused by neighbour, uh, violent husband, by unfortunate coincidence, developed schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or whatever. These are, this is not another unfortunate life event. These are the understandable consequences, often in coded form, in metaphorical form, of the life events people have been through. So, again, this is going to be horribly brief, but the emerging model is, I think, and you're seeing this all over the place nowadays, it's quite interesting, the jargon term is trauma-informed. As an alternative to a medical model, Perhaps we need is a, what we need, I think, is a trauma-informed model, which, of course, doesn't mean that every single person in services has suffered some identifiable trauma. Some people haven't. Some people, it's, you know, rather different kind of more long-term corrosive or difficult life events and so on. But for a number of people, this does fit. And at the very least, the model needs to be trauma-informed so we can watch out for it. And the emerging evidence... Uh, suggests a pathway. This is what it seems to be looking like. If you want to sum it up absolutely in a nutshell, I think the emerging model suggests that our core formulation, in a sense, should be attachment difficulties followed by trauma. doesn't fit absolutely everybody, fits an awful lot of people, certainly fits an awful lot of people with a diagnosis of psychosis. And the emerging evidence does suggest a model which explains this, you know, provides some support for this in terms of what we know about kind of neuroscience. Uh, not an area I'm an expert in at all, but it appears, for example, that when people experience trauma, then memories get encoded in a particular way in the 
in the brain so that overwhelmingly traumatic me memories may be split off, may be kind of you know, detached from autobiographical narrative, may reappear in the form of unusual beliefs or autonomic arousal, or terror or hearing voices and so on. So I'm going to fast forward just to that one. That's a kind of a rather primitive pictorial way of representing it. And these arrows should really be going around in circles with each other, really. It's a kind of interactive process. But attachment problems, trauma abuse of various sorts, uh, mediated by what we know about um, neuroscience from biology, uh, a final common pathway possibly of dissociation, a process of splitting off different parts of your experience, splitting off mind and body and so on. And it can lead to a whole range of different, what we call symptoms currently, but are perhaps much better understood as survival strategies. These are ways that people survived unbearable events. I'm saying the same as previous speakers. Um, they were useful at the time. They were creative and necessary ways of getting through. They can outlive their usefulness. So they're not necessarily present for the, necessary for the present day. They can become a handicap. So that's the work we need to do with people. And here's one of my favourite quotes. It's from that wonderful book by Judith Herman, Trauma and Recovery. People who have survived atrocities often tell their stories in a highly emotional, contradictory and fragmented manner, which undermines their credibility and thereby serves the twin imperatives of truth-telling and secrecy. Witnesses as well as victims are subject to the dialectic of trauma. It is difficult for an observer to remain clear-headed and calm, to see more than a few fragments of the picture at one time, to retain all the pieces, and to find a language that conveys fully and persuasively what one has seen. I think that's a rather wonderful quote, because I think it, for me, captures that sense of being in the presence of someone who is highly, highly distressed and disturbed. It's confusing, it's overwhelming, it's fragmented, it doesn't seem to make sense. We can get sucked into that confusion and feeling of overwhelm, which I think is when we reach for labels and medications and so on. And what we have to do is not be sucked in and be as confused and overwhelmed by the double think, you know, the metaphorical messages, the overwhelming pain and distress that we are witness to, and what helps us to, um, you know, to keep on our feet, to remain grounded in that presence. There's a lot of evidence for the healing effect of autobiographical narrative from attachment theory and so on. The more we can make sense of our experiences, and I think this also applies to uh, the more we can make sense of other people's experiences, the more we will be able to be contain them. We can feel contained ourselves by some kind of narrative understanding. We can help them to contain their story and to work through what they've experienced. And of course, another word for a narrative begins with an F, is a formulation. You know, a formulation is a kind of narrative. It can serve that purpose. So thinking about formulation in psychosis, I think it's very often a question of searching for clues. And we may be formulating, in fact, I hope we are at an early stage. We may be formulating at a late stage. But one of the things I like to do is to look through the notes. I'm, I'm looking for sort of tiny things that haven't reached any kind of official letters or reports or anything, <laughs> but details of what did the voice say that you heard and what kind of unusual belief did you have and when did it seem to happen? And you can often get clues to what may be going on by doing that. And it's a fascinating process to do with teams, actually, to encourage them in you know, this kind of detective work. You know, so let's think about the content of the voices. Let's think about the content of the unusual experiences. Um, a recent example um, was that um, a team were describing to me a man with a diagnosis of psychosis um, who had a number of unusual experiences, one of which was that he heard a woman screaming, a very unpleasant experience for him. And there were one or two little hints in his, um, the rest of his story about how he, I think it was something like he'd given up playing rugby, although he was apparently a good player because he was, didn't like to feel that, there might, that he might be hurting other people or, you know, something nasty might happen to him. And together I just... You know, after you've done this for a while, as you all know, you have certain kind of fairly common hypotheses, which, and my hypothesis, which was shared by the team when we thought about it, was, you know, has, has he witnessed domestic violence? You know, who was the screaming woman? Was this his mum? That there are a number of other reasons to suppose that there was a secret in the family, big hints had been dropped, and interestingly, 
So we have to have this as our very, very, very tentative formulation. Sometimes I don't even write this down because, you, you know, when you put something in words, it becomes sort of, you know, it's almost like it becomes true in some people's eyes. So we have to have this difficult balance of holding a formulation very, very tentatively, but being willing to make those guesses, which may not be accurate, and being willing to wait until we can confirm them. And I think another very important function of team formulation is to help the team to wait so that we don't feel we've got to go and do something, which is often so damaging, isn't it? Being with someone as opposed to leaping in to do something. So we held off and waited a bit, and um, not very long after, the um, young man confided that, yes, there had been domestic violence in the family, and it had been his job to shield his younger brother from his father's anger. And so, you know, that's an example of the kind of interesting detective work that I think a formulation can provide a structure for. Okay, so this kind of model and theory is reaching everywhere. Here's an editor in the British Journal of Psychiatry in 2012. After decades of ignoring or minimising the prevalence and effects of negative events in childhood, researchers have recently established that a broad range of adverse childhood events are significant risk factors for most mental health problems, including psychosis. The implications of our having finally taken seriously the causal role of childhood adversity are profound. They certainly are profound. Okay, this is my little joke with a serious message. This is my free gift, Lucy's free one-size-fits-all formulation for long-term service users. Um, this is what it looks like. Service user X, insert almost any, any name you like, has unmet attachment needs and unresolved trauma from their early life. X tries to meet these through psychiatric services, but fails since services are not set up to do this. Still needy, but unable to achieve enough emotional security to move on, X ends up trading symptoms for whatever psychiatric care is on offer. Staff are initially sympathetic, but become increasingly frustrated at X's lack of progress. The resulting dynamic may end up repeating X's early experiences of neglect, rejection or abuse. Both parties become stuck, frustrated and demoralised in this vicious circle. Does that ring some bells? I'm afraid it does, doesn't it? And um, I once presented this to a group of 50 psychiatrists and they all nodded ruefully. Nobody's ever actually disagreed with me. And, you know, it's not the fault of a particular professional group. It's not any individual's fault. It's a systemic thing, isn't it? We get caught up in these unhelpful dynamics where we end up not only not helping people, but re-traumatising people. It's not what we want to do. It's not what we intend to do, but it's too often what happens. And I think the root of that problem is because we're applying the wrong model to the understanding of human distress. You know, if we, um, if we meet someone from first contact, we have a chance of doing something very different. So here's what it could look like. Service user X has unmet attachment needs and unresolved trauma from their early life. This is the point at which people often present to services. My daughter did that drum roll, it's quite clever, isn't it? But um, formulate here from first contact with services. This is what should be happening, I think. And, you know, people sometimes say to me, well, you know, I have to fill in this 38-page assessment form. I've got no time to formulate. You know, and there's some truth in that. But I guess as somebody who, you know, has been... I mean, I, I sort of automatically think formulation as a psychologist. I think probably most psychologists do. It's not an extra that you do. It's the way, the whole way you think about people. And, you know, I think, I hope we should... I think we should be doing this in every, every part of our contact with someone. And it actually doesn't take very long to write something down, to have a brief discussion with someone along the lines of, you know, it looks as though recent events have brought to, to the fore things that may have been unresolved from your past and it looks as though you may need some help and support with that. You know, that's a formulation, isn't it? Two sentences long, you know, it's, it's not very difficult to get that far and you can add to it as the person goes throughout their journey in the mental health system. But by simply doing that, you can set someone off on a very different path than a diagnostic path, which is essentially you know, redefining their reality in terms of an illness and that can set the whole unhelpful kind of process in motion whereby people become long-term patients. Okay, so one of the reasons that I don't like the word psychosis is because I think very many of the, these people can, uh, very often we can actually replace that by, some, by something like, you know, complex trauma reaction or severe trauma reaction. 
Having said that, it doesn't, of course, apply just to psychosis, but it, I think it certainly often does apply to psychosis, although not in every case. So this is the reason for promoting a, this particular tool, which I think can be quite a powerful tool for culture change, formulation with individuals, formulation with teams. Um, it's not the only one, as I say, and I think if you were setting up as a, from scratch, you might do it kind of rather differently, but the dilemma I've been faced with throughout my working life is how to bring about culture change within existing systems. And I think formulation has enough credibility and power to do that within existing systems, and there's a certain amount of research that suggests that it can, that it can do that, that it helps what you end up is not just a better intervention plan for A, B, and C, but a different way that the whole service is thinking about the people they're working with. Now, the obvious next step, once you have a sort of reasonable amount of formulating going on, is to try and shift the whole service towards a trauma-informed model, and we've been talking about that in CUMTAF. We had a CPD day, which a lot of staff attended, and about you know having a whole service based on the awareness that trauma may be a causal factor. Um, Eleanor came along, did a very powerful whole day workshop a couple of years ago now, which went down very well. You know these things take time, but I think in principle we're signed up to try to promote this model, and I think that's the way to go. So. And this is the way not to go. Just thought I'd, um, as you will have, you've, um, diagnosis has been fairly thoroughly hacked a bit earlier today, but um, just to kind of, you know, add my thoughts. And interestingly, it's not just um, traditional critics of psychiatry who have been saying, look, diagnosis has had its day. I've got these quotes, which actually aren't on the handout, but I suddenly thought over lunch, I'll put these in too. Um, the, the interesting thing about these quotes is they're from the very people who invented, and I use the word advisedly, invented the diagnoses. So the most outspoken critic of DSM-5 has been Professor Alan Francis, the chair of DSM-4, uh, the former director of NIMH, the world's largest funder of mental health research. Uh, Patients deserve better. The weakness is its lack of validity. Well, you can't have a bigger weakness than that, can you? lack of validity, the chair of the current DSM-5 committee, this is the best defence that they're left with. We've been telling patients for several decades that we're waiting for biomarkers, in other words, the evidence that supports the contention that these are best understood as illnesses, we're still waiting. And Professor Alan Francis, in an unusually frank moment, there's no definition of a mental disorder, I mean, you just can't define it, it's bullshit. Um, he said it, not me. And um, one of the main defences seems to be, well, it's the best we've got. It may not be perfect. It's the best we've got. And I would strongly challenge that. We don't need to wait to some mythical alternative before we stop doing something that is not evidence-based and that's actually damaging. And the alternative to diagnosis is not to diagnose people. Let's be honest about it. The alternative is to ask people what their difficulties are. Your difficulties are mood swings, your difficulties are feeling very low, your difficulties are not being able to go out of the house, and so on and so on. And if we want a slightly more sophisticated take on it, you know, an alternative is formulation. Psychological formulation, I think, is legitimate and a powerful and a useful alternative. Um, I'm proud to say that my professional body, the Division of Clinical Psychology, came out with this statement May last year. I don't know if you saw it in the paper, it was actually on the front page of the Observer, that was quite interesting. The DCP is of the view that it is timely and appropriate to affirm publicly that the current classification system, as outlined in DSM and ICD, in respect to the functional psychiatric diagnoses, has significant conceptual and empirical limitations. There is thus a need for a paradigm shift in classification in relation to these diagnoses towards one which is no longer based on a disease model. That's pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? It's you know, in some senses, I think, quite courageous to come out and say there, say that. Easier for psychologists to say it than psychiatrists, but we finally got our act together. Um, and we're working really on kind of further implementation of those ideas. It's, it's one thing to say this. It's another thing to work through the implications. But it's a little, it is a little of an emperor's new clothes situation, I think. If one professional body is brave enough to say this, then I hope others might follow. So... We talked about stories, we talked about meanings, we talked about listening to people, we talked about collaboration, we talked about encouraging, imparting hope, we talked about being with people, we talked about therapeutic relationships. Formulation can be a vehicle, I think, for implementing all those things. So I think in some senses, particularly if you take it 
to as if you see it as an alternative to not a, just an addition to diagnosis i think it's fair to say you know it can be seen as a radical act it put back puts back what psychiatry takes out it restores meaning restores agency restores hope for staff and service users and it's about the opposite of silencing people it's about being willing to listen to people's stories being willing to face up to the reality of trauma and distress and it's about giving service users a voice okay thank you